Good morning. I've shared some earlier reflections on Nehemiah with you. First about sharing God's heart for his world and people and how he can use that. Secondly, about how God prepared Nehemiah to be equipped to do something about it. And lastly, how Nehemiah approached God in prayer and in doing that he acknowledged that his community had let God down and they had not lived lives as they should. Today I'd like to look at chapter 1 verses 8 to 10. And at first it seems strange that he's saying to God, remember your promises. Yet we can be sure on, and on powerful ground when we come to God asking him to remember his promises. Nehemiah said, Lord, you made a promise to Moses and this nation, and I ask you now to make good on it. And Nehemiah quoted from both Leviticus 26 and Deuteronomy verse 30. In Psalm 81 verse 10, God says to his people, Open your mouth wide and I will fill it. God won't open his storehouse until we open our mouth and ask him to perform his promises. And Nehemiah is claiming this promise. If you return to me and keep my commandments and do them, then I will return to you. Nehemiah quoted this conditional promise. It was the condition of returning to God and keeping his commandments. And he couldn't really know if the nation were keeping the commandments, but that he knew he was. He identified with the nation in their sin. And he could also identify um, the nation within himself as being a godly fulfillment of these conditions. And not only did God ask him to bless him, he actually asked him to bless him when he went to speak about the king of Persia about this matter. Nehemiah wasn't just going to pray about it, to ask to do something about the story state of Jerusalem's wall and people. And he knows that without God's intervention, he can do nothing. But his prayer is quite specific. He doesn't say, God, make this better, or God, please bring someone else along to deal with this problem. Instead, his prayer is, God, use me to make it better. Alan Redpath often says, God makes us aware of a need so that we are earnest and persistent in waiting upon God until an overwhelming sense of the world's need becomes a specific burden in my soul for one particular piece of work which God would have me do. That's what happened to Nehemiah. Spurgeon said, Nehemiah didn't begin to speak with other people about what they could do, and nor did he draw up a wonderful scheme about what might be done if thousands of people joined in the enterprise. But it occurred to him that he would do something himself. And yet Nehemiah was so sure that this was something of God, that he was willing to approach the king. And sometimes we're afraid to ask other people to support God's work, the fear of being turned down. But this is a good example of how God is, when God is leading us, we can boldly ask and leave the results up to him. It made me think of a couple of examples recently. The Trussell Trust was founded in 1997 by Paddy and Carol Hendenson. They were using a legacy that was left by Carol's mother, Betty Trussell. And initially it started as a charity working in bulk area to improve the conditions for sleeping children on a railway station there. But in two, the year 2000, 20 years ago, they began to work in the UK too, opening up the first food bank in the hometown of Salisbury when they were con contacted by a British mother who was struggling to feed her children and challenged them. And by the end of 2019, the food bank um, now distributes 1.6 million food bank parcels to people in crisis. And that was 19% more than last year. And half a million of these food parcels went to children. So in the last five years, the Trussell Trust has increased its work by 73%. It's worked with banks, it's worked with other charities, it's worked with the government. And they're now doing work to actually have a project that has a real thing where they want to try and end poverty so that the need for a food bank wouldn't be there. 
This was a Christian vision set out that now embraces many people from many faiths and none, but actually it's made quite a difference in our country. And today I was, I heard about John Hume, the politician who died, and early in his life he started training as a priest and then became a teacher and was called a politician. And yet when he was awarded the Nobel Prize, um, he, it, they said of him, John Hume has throughout been the clearest and most consistent of Northern Ireland's political leaders in his work for a peaceful solution. The foundations of the peace agreement reflect the principles he stood for. And those principles came from his Christian values, something that God had put on his heart and that he was willing to put into action. So that made me think, what principles has God put on your heart and mine? What stage of the journey are we on? Do we need to ask God for the vision? Or do we need to be prepared to ask and inquire about the things God cares about because we already have a passion? Are we ready to identify with the things that have gone wrong in our world and realise it comes from us not living the way that God wants us to do and are willing to change? Are we at the stage where we should be asking God to intervene but be willing to do something ourselves? Are we willing to trust God that if we ask him to remember his people, he does bring salvation, he does bring justice, he does use his people to do his will? Where are we in our journey of prayer and action?